So in video 2378, we made this thing. It's a Swashplate CVT. Now, there's been quite a lot of comments, and, and it's fairly common, actually, that the comments very often say very similar things. So rather than repeating myself probably about 30 or 40 times, I thought I would make a video as a follow-up to this, explaining a little bit about how I think it works, because to me it looks as if there's some confusion about how people think it works. I mean, one thing, they think uh, it's friction. They think this roller is rolling along, and the roll of the roller is what drives this. Other people seem to think that it's the contact point between the cone here and the edge of this disc, which is responsible for that action. Now, I would disagree with that. Just because it's rotating doesn't mean that it relies on contact points and friction. Actually, I think it's a better way to think of this as being a lever. So if we take it as stationary for a moment and slice through it, then what this plate here is, is a lever. Now levers are something that we understand, so they're very common things. I mean, if you get a bar, you place a fulcrum point, you have a load here and you press here, then that's a lever and you find something like that in, say, scissors. The levers come in different types and that's called a type 1 lever. There's also a type 2 and a type 3 lever. A type 2 or a second class lever has the fulcrum at one end, the effort at the other end and the load somewhere between them. A third class lever sort of swaps that around. It's got the load at one end, the fulcrum at the other end and the effort applied somewhere between them. An example of a um, second class would be a wheelbarrow, an example of the third class would be a spade. I've removed the roller so we can actually have a better look at this. Now, if I press with my finger there, which is exactly what the roller was doing, then of course we can see it operating as a lever. As it happens, the fulcrum point is at the centre. The effort we're applying is here, which is where the roller would be, and of course the output is here, near to the fulcrum, and that's where the load will be. So it's operating like a lever at this slice and stationary point, and it's moving this up and down, which is what we want it to do when it's a lever. Now, it makes no difference if I do it there, or I turn around 90 degrees and do it there, it's still a second class lever. All we're actually doing when it's a circle is we're making that jump smaller and smaller. So 45, 22, 10, 5, 1. We're making very small jumps until we get to such a small jump. It looks like rotation, but it isn't. It's still just a lever operating. Now, all this cone does is act as a stop. It just prevents me from pushing it too far. All the roller does is act as a, a push down. It's not actually rolling, so there's no friction and no contact point that is involved in here. It's a second class lever being pushed on by an effort that is supplied by that arm. Now, when it's tiny, tiny jumps, of course, what we see is continuous motion, and we think it's rolling, but it isn't. It's just taking tiny jumps to push down on a second-class lever. That is, in essence, how this thing is working. So the next thing we sort of need to get our head around are triangles. Triangles are a little bit of terminology. If we have a triangle with an angle theta, then the side next to that angle is the adjacent, the side opposite is the opposite, and the side that joins those two up are the hypotenuse. If that angle is fixed, and remember on this, we're always pressing here, so that angle is fixed, then if we change the size of the opposite, we'll change the length of the hypotenuse, otherwise it wouldn't be a triangle anymore, it must change. And if you look at the drawing, you can see that. If you change the size of the hypotenuse, that is, you move that line down, the opposite will get smaller and smaller. Equally, if you make the opposite bigger and bigger but maintain that angle, you've got to move it out so the hypotenuse gets longer. Now, the hypotenuse is actually the lever. So as we change that fulcrum point, what we're doing is changing the length of the opposite of the hypotenuse. And of course with this, what we do is we shove this up and down. So we're changing the length of the opposite. That changes the length that this travels, even though it doesn't look like it. It must do because that's a relationship of triangles. And so the distance it travels through space is longer when we shove that up. When we shove that up and do that, of course, we change the properties of the lever. Now, as we're turning the input at a fixed rate and we're changing the distance, of course, we must change the speed of the output. 
because speed is distance over time and that's changing. That means it's in effect we get one speed of input, one speed of output, and that speed changes depending on the length of the opposite, which is what we're changing by shoving this up and down. Now, that's the static version, if you like. Let's have a bit of a look at what it is when we begin to rotate it. Because when we begin to rotate it, what happens is that push jumps to the next position and this begins to move around like that, just like a screw. Now a screw is technically an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder. But when you operate a screw, of course, it uses the principles of the lever. So the lever principles apply to a screw. It's why you can screw a screw in with a screwdriver, because it's basic leverage. This is screwing, <laughs> sorry for that term, is screwing around that cone, operating as a second class lever. And of course, we're changing by moving this, the length of the hypotenuse, and so the distance travelled, which means we're changing the speed. And that is how I think that works. I don't think that has anything to do with the contact of this and the contact of the cone. And I also don't think it has anything to do with friction here. The friction is always there. There's always friction. But the main player here is actually the push in a screw-wise direction of this arm in relation to the fulcrum and the length of the opposite. Nothing to do with the friction and the friction drive, or at least that's how I see it. So for me, this is a second-class lever operating on an inclined plane, and the reason you get rotation at the output is because it's constrained. Now you have to remember that what I'm doing here is creating a model and explaining the operating principle of a device that already exists. I mean, I said this in the original interview, I didn't invent this thing, I'm not making any claims for it, I'm actually just trying to explain its operation and show how to make a model of it, because this is a long-standing device, and I have been told that this, as a CVT, has actually been used in cars. So, if you're leaving a comment, oh, that can't possibly work, then, you, without being rude, you haven't really watched the video because it's already a machine that works. I'm just explaining how it might possibly work and creating a model of it. But it does seem to have created a little bit of confusion and quite a lot of discussion, particularly around a can't possibly work, it's a friction machine. So I thought I would go a bit further into how I think it actually operates. I hope it was of interest. Thank you very much for watching. And please do remember to like and subscribe.